Okay. Um, hello. There's no one here at all <laughs> uh, because of the strike. Uh, there's no one here on Zoom either. Maybe someone will show up on Zoom later. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I made it abundantly clear that uh, you don't have to attend. Um, so anyway, I'm just going to give my lecture and uh, and hopefully some people can watch the recording. Um, uh, depending on assuming the strike is still going on Thursday, which seems likely to me, but I don't know. Um, uh, depending on whether the same thing happens in my seminar uh, later today, I might just say that I'm going to stay home in Berkeley and do classes over Zoom only, but uh, I'll let you know what happens with that. Anyway, a little weird to lecture to no one, but I've done it before. So, um, right, so where we are in the book. We're the transcendental logic. We finished the transcendental analytic, which was the positive part, um, right? That is the part that showed what, how synthetic a priori judgments are possible. Um, and uh, not only that, but showed like exactly which synthetic a priori judgments are possible, or at least what the fundamental ones are. Um, now, we're in the transcendental dialectic, which is the negative part. Um, and it's, see, I mean, maybe it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a wrong way to think about it in the sense that the transcendental analytic already both had the positive outcome that um, we can have synthetic a priori knowledge about possible objects of experience and the negative outcome that we can't have any other kind of synthetic a priori judgment uh, knowledge. Um, but the transcendental dialectic is going to explain why um, it seems like we can have this other kind of transcendental, of a synthetic a priori, uh, we can make this other kind of synthetic a priori judgment, I guess is the correct way to say that. Um, that is, can correctly make this <laughs> other kind of synthetic a priori judgment. And, um, The transcendental dialectic has two parts. The first part is the concept of real reason, where Kant developed the idea that there's these three transcendental ideas. Um, the <clears throat> um, the rational soul, the world as a whole, and God. Um, that is the ideas of those things. Um, and uh, um, which are related to the three types of syllogism in the same way that the categories are related to the different forms of judgment. Okay. Hello. Now there's one person here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, so we finished that part, and now we're on to the dialectical inferences. where Kant explains 
And I think, you know, so the relationship here is supposed to be that this is like a metaphysical deduction of the three ideas of pure reason. Um, and this is like an attempt to acting as if there were a transcendental deduction of the three ideas of pure reason uh, show that certain things uh, must be true. Um, just as in the analytic, we had the system of principles try, uh, showing that um, because the categories are objectively valid, certain things must be true of experience. So here we're trying to show that because we think the ideas of pure reason must be objectively valid, certain things must be true of the supersensible conditions of experience. Right? I mean, the whole point is here we're not talking about things that can be experienced anymore. Um, so, and you know, that's the sign that, as we've already shown in the transcendental analytics, something must have gone wrong because we can't have synthetic a priori knowledge that goes beyond the limits of experience. But again, we're dealing with an illusion that makes it seem like we can. And so, uh, so there's three parts of the illusion corresponding to those three ideas. And the first one is called the paralogism of pure reason. The second one. Infinity. And the third one is called the ideal. So, um, and so, and the reading for today was the uh, morality. Actually, I noticed this every year after the fact, and I keep thinking I should change it, but I made a note to think about that better next time I teach this course. But, so actually, the beginning of the paralogism is the part of the assigned reading for last time, even though I didn't say anything about it. Um, but the remainder of the paralogism is the uh, assigned reading for this time. So, um, okay, so that's what we're talking about. And so these have to do with those three rational ideas of the soul, the world, and God or that is of the supposed sciences of rational psychology. Remember, soul is just a translation of the Greek word psyche, right? So psychology is the science of the soul. Rational psychology would be a science that tells us what the soul is not based on experience. That's what this this paralogism is about. Then this would be about rational cosmology, things we could know about the world as a whole, not based on experience. And then finally, this is about what Kant calls transcendental theology. Sometimes he calls it rational theology, but I think but usually these two are called rational, and this is called transcendental. Um, all right. So in any case. So I'm going to start talking about this one. Um, Unless there are questions from Zoom land. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to raise this. Once again, you just go back here. So. Um, so. Um, so that, like, generally speaking, there's supposed to be, in a sense, just one mistake in the whole transcendental dialectic. Um, right, the mistake was, as I tried to explain last time, that this is the judgment, right? This is the condition of the judgment. And this is the rule of the judgment. Um, um, on the first midterm, you know, the the second prompt was about this. Very few people chose the second prompt, and the ones who did, as usual, didn't really manage to explain each 
presumably means I'm not really managing to explain why what's involved in thinking of a judgment as a rule applied on a condition. I just, you know, maybe there's something about it that doesn't make sense, and that's why I can't explain it. But I just wanted to point out that like if you want to understand the respect in which a hypothetical judgment or a disjunctive judgment are the same kind of thing as a categorical judgment. I mean, you have to say more than because like a hypothetical judgment doesn't just have a subject concept based, uh, you know, I mean, there is a subject concept, but the subject concept isn't the condition. The condition is a judgment, right? Like, I think if you had to call one of the concepts here the subject concept, it probably could be A, right? I mean, that's the thing we're saying something about. We're saying that if C is B, what you're saying about A is that if C is B, then it's B, right? But A is the condition, the condition, this is the condition. So like when you get to more common, and I think this is even true if you go from universal judgments to particular judgments, as you get to more complicated types of judgments, the, the simple way of thinking about it, where you just think, you know, there's a subject list of characteristics and a predicate list of characteristics, like it's not abstract enough to take all these cases into account. Whereas the condition rule, we can say, oh yeah, this is the condition, and on this condition, the rule is that A has to be B. Well, anyway, never mind that. So, um, right, and the, so this is a judgment, and then the syllogism, like, provides a, another condition that explains why this rule applies on this condition. So, um, so this is like, a, it's a, so to speak, a demand of reason that I be able to produce such a, a condition. That is, if I just assert something, like all cinnabar is red, then I can be asked, well, like, why? What makes all cinnabar red? Um, and uh, if I can't, if I have no explanation, then um, you know what I say is vulnerable to attack, so to speak, on those grounds. So it's. In other words, the um, this is part of this is maybe one way of understanding what sense like reason doesn't apply directly to objects. Reason doesn't tell you what the condition is, what the explanation is. It's up to the understanding to find the explanation. But reason demands the explanation which the understanding by itself would not, right? Like the business of the understanding is just to think things uh, through on conditions, right? And uh, like uh, it's reason and, you know, I mean, there aren't really little people walking around inside our head called understanding and reason, right? Like this is, you know, it's sort of, so to speak, a conceptual analysis of, of what thinking is like into different parts. And the part we call reason is the part that consists in asking, well, you know, but why? What's the explanation here? So, um, um, and the thing about the series of prosyllogisms was that, like, no matter what I supply here, I can always be asked again. For you know what's well, what's the explanation for that? Um, and um, I'm only fully justified in asserting this if all of 
those conditions hold. Um, right? In other words, if, if the explanation for um, this condition being the explanation of this judgment is supposed to be D, but it turns out that D is not true, then I don't have an explanation of C, and therefore I don't have an explanation of the judgment. So they all, like going back, all have to be filled in in order for like reason to be satisfied with this judgment. Now, obviously, what that means is reason, I mean, or I think according to Kant, obviously what it what it should mean is that reason is never going to be fully satisfied with my judgments, right? Um, but uh, um, at least not with empirical judgments. Um, because I don't, I'll never know the complete explanation. Experience is always conditioned. Um, but um, but the transcendental illusion consists in saying, well, you know, since I'm responsible for all of this every time I make a judgment, um, and I am able to make judgments, right? Like. Um, uh, the transcendental deduction of the categories showed that, that I'm able to deploy legitimate empirical concepts. That means I'm able to make some judgments, you know. So, but if those, if every one of those judgments involves me in this responsibility of your totality of condition, so therefore there must be something, just as there is something about, there must be something about the object that allows me to apply empirical concepts to it, there must be something about the object that um, guarantees a complete series of explanations. So again, Kant thinks that's, you know, that's a mistake. Um, what it takes for me to make a judgment really is just to be responsible for this series or something like that. It's not to actually have the complete series. Um, and uh, in any case, uh, nothing that could ever, nothing that I can legitimately represent in the object could ever be a guarantee of this because the object is always the object of experience and experience always, uh, represents it as conditioned, as needing needing further explanation. And I, you know, I tried to explain why that is because you know the, the fact that we know objects by experience, by technical intuition, means that the explanation is the complete explanation is in the object, um, not in us. And you know, so like no matter how much we learn about it, we never um, get an unconditioned explanation of what the object is doing. To us. But again, so the illusion is to say, well, something must guarantee this. It can't, and we realize that it can't be the empirical object itself. So we say, well, there must be something that's not sensitive. So we don't and can't have experience of this other thing. But as Kant puts it, we get we have we think we have an inferred concept of it. We think even though we can't experience it, um, we can like infer that there must be such a thing. And in the paralogisms in particular, the type of syllogism we're talking about is a categorical syllogism. Um, therefore, A is B. These three little dots mean therefore. Um, um, so, uh, we're looking for a condition that's 
eternal to the object of A. A is the, the subject of the conclusion and therefore is the subject of the syllogism overall. And we're looking for an explanation of why the predicate applies to it that um, takes the form of something about the object of A itself. It's not, in general, it's not something that's contained in the concept of it, right? Because if it were, this would be an analytic method. And that's um, at least not necessary for a syllogism, for the minor premise to be an analytic judgment. Um, it's not clear what, uh, well, never mind, I won't get into that. But so it doesn't, so, so it's not in general contained in the concept of it. But uh, you know what the minor premise says is it's contained in the object of it, right? So like this this minor premise here could be something like all bodies are heavy, or you might say. Um, uh, Major premise could be everything that's heavy falls when unsupported, <laughs> right? And the conclusion would be all bodies fall when they're unsupported, something like that. Um, so, um, um, right, this says not that bodies are heavy by definition, but that in fact, Things that are picked out by my concept body um, based on experience, they're, I'm saying they're all heavy. So, um, so now when I'm when I'm looking for a um, when I'm looking for a Guarantee that um, there's a complete. Oh, hello. I don't feel that, that bad that I'm late. No, <laughs> so there's there's a couple of people people here on Zoom. So, <laughs> um, so, um, so, I wonder if there's something I'm missing in this. I'm sure. Probably is, but anyway. <laughs> So what, like when I'm, I'm looking for a guarantee in the object, there's a complete internal explanation um, for uh, everything that can be predicated of that object. I mean, So I think like the way to think about it is this, you know, that in general, many different things can be predicated of the same object, um, uh, like one after another, right? Like it has a series of, of states, you know, first it's B and then it's C and then it's D. Um, so like, And, well, so I mean, uh, we can't expect the, the internal conditions of A, even all taken together, to explain this order of states. Right? Because after all, you know, A is the same and it changed from B to C. So there must be an external condition responsible for that. But nevertheless, like we can still ask for an internal explanation of everything that happens to A in the sense that if you know completely what A is, then you'll know uh, um, 
why it's capable of each one of these states. You have a complete explanation of why it's capable of each one of those states. Um, so that is, I mean, to go back to a more abstract explanation, we're like what what the illusion is leading for us to ask for here is that every empirical object should stand, should stand in the right relation to some non-empirical, some transcendent thing that, um, that provides the complete explanation um, for all the judgments that can be made about this object. And, but in the case of um, categorical syllogism, the, the right relation is like being the internal nature of the object. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's just the most that I can characterize the wax um, example of the wax melts and so see it as wax. Yes. Is that similar? Yes, it is similar to that. Although what I'm gonna ask in a second is why according to Kant, this turns out to really be about um, the object of inner sense, right? The wax obviously is the object of outer sense. Um, but yeah, it is like that, you know. I mean, uh, the, according to Descartes, you know, this every type of substance has one principal attribute that makes it what it is. And that everything else that can happen to it must be a possible modification of that one intrinsic attribute. And you know, so they, so Descartes says, like in the case of bodies, the one intrinsic attribute is extension, and in the case of minds, the one intrinsic at attribute is thought. So I mean, honestly, the thought side is exactly what what Kant is talking about in the paralysis. Um, and he is clearly thinking about Descartes because he discusses um, um, the possibility of beginning the consideration by saying I exist. <laughs> yeah, so um, um, yeah, so it, it is like that, but there's but he is it the same kind of question. Yeah. The types of problems they form that that transcend the thing and it becomes more innocent. Well, I mean, I'm going to talk about this in a second, but it's like, I mean, so I guess put it this way. I mean, what I was about to say is because we're ask, asking for the absolute inner explanation of everything that could possibly happen to this object, we're asking for to, to see everything about the object as states of some absolute substance. Right, so we're looking for um, uh, uh, um, something that can be known as a substance, like in advance of experience, and be used to explain why it's all the experiences we have that object are possible. Um, and so, it, so like you might, so you might think that the conclusion of the argument in the paralogisms would be um, something like uh, um, every every object of experience has a super sensible, substantial form. That is what Descartes thinks, right? Descartes thinks extension is not an object of the senses. It's an object of the mind alone, particularly. Right. So that is what Descartes thinks. It's also, but I mean, it's also what uh, Aristotelians think. Um, 
fit in the sense what Locke thinks? She is, I guess. I mean, it makes the concept substance seem questionable to him, but he just, depending on how you understand Locke, I mean, he, does, he still doesn't think we can do without it. So anyway, I mean, so this that's what you might expect this section to be about, but instead it turns out to be rational psychology in particular. Um, so why is that? I mean, like, roughly speaking, I mean, it has something to do with the fact that um, what's given in inner sense is something internal. <laughs> um, like, if you want to look for a subject that um, everything else is just an attribute of, that, you know, a touch of saying that there isn't anything like that in bodies. That, I mean, so if you say, well, what about Descartes? Well, I mean, this is exactly where Descartes got in trouble, right? Because Descartes said that bodies are nothing but extension and the modes of extension. And then people said, well, extension of what? Right? Like extension has to be extension of something. And the something can't be specified just by relationship to other bodies. Seemingly, you have to know what it is first. Right, so like following that line of thought is how, it's, and it's, I think, not to be like, um, um, reproduces fairly well in the antiquity. Following that line of thought is how Leibniz got to the conclusion, well, there must be something in bodies that's not a body, that's the real substance there. And what does that have to be? So, you know, um, Go back to the amphiboly. Um, as object of pure understanding, on the other hand, every substance must have inner determinations and powers which pertain to its inner reality. This is this is Kant like speaking for Locke, right? Like Kant channeling Locke. So 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 Locke is saying, look, if you know, if we're supposed to understand, supposed if this is really supposed to be the object of the mind alone, then you have to be able to tell me like like um, what non-relative properties of this thing does the mind perceive in it? And you know, when Descartes says extension, that's that's not enough. So, um, by the way, this is also very similar to Hume's argument in the uh, treatise that the concept of a um, of a body is somehow incoherent. Right? He says the same thing, like extension of what? So. Um, But so Kant goes on, but what inner accidents can I entertain in thought, save only those which my inner sense presents to me? They must be something which is either itself a thinking or analogous to thinking. Right? So Leibniz's conclusion is like if there's some internal explanation of anything, it must be um, something like a mind, an object of internal sense. So, I mean, somehow, and like, although Kant thinks the conclusion is wrong, he seems to think that that step is right. That is, it's right that, it's, that inner determinations are given in inner sense. Like, in other words, maybe that's why it's called inner sense. Right? I mean, what makes it inner as opposed to outer? You know? Um, so, 
Um, similarly, at the beginning of the paralogisms, he says, um, about this concept where he says, or oh, if you like the judgment, I think. Right, so I think is ego cognito. Like whenever Kant talks about the transcendental, so I mean, usually uh, when, Kant, when Kant in English says transcendental ego, in German it says ich, right? The transcendental I. <laughs> um, but I mean, the translation ego is correct in the sense that the transcendental I is always short for ich denke, I think. Right? It's the transcendental I think. And that is a reference to Descartes. So, like at the beginning of the paralogisms, Kant is talking about this concept or judgment, I think. And he says, this is on, uh, I should have said where I was reading before, but it went off the place again. But anyway. This is on B399, page 329 of Smith. As is easily seen, this is the vehicle of all concepts and therefore also of transcendental concepts. And so is always included in the conceiving of these latter and is itself transcendental. But it can have no special designation because it serves only to introduce all our thought as belonging to consciousness. So, so far, I think what he's saying is, um, where's my room? I don't want to go in this direction. Like what, it, what he's addressing there, I think, right? It, the paragraph begins, we now come to a concept which is not included in the general list of transcendental concepts. So a general list of transcendental concepts, I think, is the table of categories. And he's saying we're coming to a concept which is transcendental, but which doesn't isn't found in the table of categories. And he's explaining why it doesn't belong there. And he's saying because it's not actually directly a concept of an object, it's like a vehicle of concepts in general. Um, so I think what he's talking about is the thing that in my table of categories, I wrote over on the top, the subjective conditions. Right, like the unity of a concept as concepts. The unity of consciousness in general as consciousness as a subjective condition for the possibility of thinking anything. Which, you know, when he talks about the transcendental ego of apperception in the deduction, in the first back to that section, section 12 of the B edition, it starts on B113, where Kant discusses these three convertible transcendentals one, true, and good. So, um, I mean, whether the transcendental unity of apperception is just this one or whether it's kind of all of them put together, I'm fine more to say that. But in any case, whatever it is, like he's, I think he's saying here the same thing he said back on B113, namely that these are, it's sort of true that these are transcendental concepts, but they're not like something I left off the table that has to be added on because they're not objective concepts. So they're not categories. Now, if you ask why is he saying it here, if he already said it back there, well, like this, the part I'm reading for, from now is the beginning of the paralogisms that's in both the A and the B edition. The paralogisms got much shorter in the B edition, and a lot of the stuff that was in them got moved to other places or just dropped. But, um, uh, but I think what's happening now is that, like, originally, when the, this section wasn't there in the A edition. Um, so in the A edition, this was the only discussion of this issue. Um, right, it wasn't, it wasn't explicit, it isn't explicitly mentioned after the table of categories in the A edition, and it isn't explicitly mentioned in the transcendental deduction in the A edition. So in the B edition, we basically have it 
in advance and then it comes up again here. So, but what, I, what I'm trying to get at with all of this is the next sentence. Meanwhile, however free it be of empirical admixture, impressions of the senses, it yet enables us to distinguish through the nature of our faculty of representation, two kinds of objects. I, as thinking, am an object of inner sense and I'm called soul. That which is an object of the outer senses is called body. Right, so somehow this, like, I don't know, maybe you should think of it just this way. Like the subjective internal conditions of thinking. It's like related to what you, wait, I think, I think it was you who was asking me about this at office hours about like the analytic unity of apperception. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe it was someone else. All right. Um, but that uh, um, um, it's it's like really just saying that um, that a concept has to be my concept. Uh, because like it can't be the object's concept because I have to be able to apply it to other objects. It has to be my concept. It's something like that. It's so uh, so it's like not something you can learn anything about the world from, including even yourself. And yet somehow it's true that um Singles out inner sense in particular. So, like everything I just said is kind of all I can say about this. I, I, I feel I really don't understand exactly how, but I mean, like the concept of reflection, the concepts of reflection, inner and outer, Kant indicates in the amphiboly that the only way we can understand those is in terms of literal inner and outer in space. Um, but, um, so when we say inner sense and outer sense, is that a different use of the concepts? Is that a different sense of inner and outer? But if it's completely different, then it wouldn't be like relevant to, to, to talk about it when you're talking about Leibniz and the amphibole, right? The whole point was that Leibniz was misusing the, the concepts of inner and outer. So, um, and because he was misusing them, he thought he had to take something from inner sense in particular to use it to explain the nature of bodies. Um, so it is that sense of inner and outer. Somehow it's right that inner sense is connected to the, the right sense of inner, but what but in what sense? Because it's not like I call inner sense inner because right. It's not like if I, you know, like I don't know, cut my finger open and look inside, that, that's inner sense. <laughs> right? It's not inner in that literal sense of inner. So I mean, there's something that's what I think there's something confusing here that I'm missing. Um, um, I mean, I think the thing about Leibniz makes it plausible why, when you look for an absolutely inner explanation of everything, in the end you're going to be talking about the soul. So think about Descartes analyst, right? About like how Descartes attempt to split it into two pieces and have one of them be the essence of body put forth. Um, but, um, but there's, so, I mean, in that sense, I can explain why that's what we're talking about in the paralogisms, but I, I feel like there's some, it's connected to some systematic thing that Kant is doing here with inner and outer that I still don't understand. Okay. Anyway, that was all kind of, I was going to talk about that later, but since you asked the question, that's why I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Since then.
if time is sent the same way that touch feel touching and smelling the touch? No, because time is like space, right? So I mean, it's, you know, there, there's many possible senses. I mean, there's there's many actual senses, which are senses of external things in space. Seeing, touching, um, I mean, all our external senses, that's why they're called external, right? So like, plus, you know, there's no reason to think that um, other, uh, rational beings couldn't have other senses, other external senses. Um, but whatever senses they have, so if they have a sense of echo, echolocation or magnetic fields or whatever, they'll all ultimately be senses um, of bodies moving in space. Um, so similarly, I think like time is, I mean, is it? Question. We, I mean, some philosophers talk about multiple inner senses. I, I don't know that Kant ever talks about it. I don't think he does. Maybe the analogy I'm making is a little bit off center. But um, but it's still like. There's empirical facts about inner sense that don't follow just from the fact that its form is time. So, you know, like how clear it is, you know, how good our memory is, stuff like that. Those things can all be varied and would still have this, the form of inner sense be time. Just like, you know, in the case of external senses, it's I mean, those things can be varied with external senses too, right? Like Kant says somewhere, like the relative, when he's talking about the magnetic, supposed magnetic matter that flows through things and causes magnetic effects, right? So he says, you know, this, you know, we can never detect this directly with our senses, but he says that coarseness of our senses has, you know, like is not relevant to the to the form of sense. Um, so yeah, so so I guess, but like sum up that long answer, time is the a priori form of any inner sensation, whereas um, senses like sight and touch and whatever are like we only know a posteriori, a posteriori that we have those senses and not some other senses. We only know it from experience. According to Kant. Um, um, okay, sorry. So that wasn't a dumb question. In fact, it was a hard question to answer. Well, no, I mean, we don't know. And like we don't, so we don't know anything by any senses a priori, because that's only the definition of a priori. We don't know it through senses, okay. right? Yeah. But I mean, but like the, to make that more, bring that more down to earth, right? Like, you know, we don't know a priori what experiences we're going to have, like what the contents of our inner sense are going to be. Any more than we know a priori what bodies we're going to encounter. We know certain things about it a priori. Actually, like Kant says um, that um, in, this is in the Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science, another book that he published later, you know, kind of uh, um, uses what he says in the critique of pure reason as a basis to build an actual metaphysical nature, right? And he says in the introduction to that, that like you might think there were to be two natural sciences, physics and psychology, but he says that actually um, uh, there isn't really a science of psychology or there isn't much of a science of psychology because um, there's, no interesting mathematical truths about 
time as such, right? As compared to geometry. But this is all we can really say is, you know, that it's continuous um, and successive and like that doesn't get you very much psychology. <laughs> so yeah, so in a sense, we know less a priori about the object of inner self. We know something about the inner self. Um, And on the other hand, in the dialectic, we try to reach synthetic a priori conclusions, not only about the soul, that's the paralogism, but also in the other sections about the world and God, right? So it's not like, um, like we have some legitimate in, uh, a priori knowledge about bodies and about the mind. Um, but not anything that goes beyond the bounds of experience. And yet we're tempted in both cases to go beyond the bounds of experience. So I don't think they differ from each other that way. If I understood what you were proposing, maybe I wouldn't. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I talked so long that I probably don't remember what you were proposing. All right. Oh. Um. So, I mean, so that's like one overarching question about this section that I can only give a, a partial answer to. Another question would be something like, okay, so why does this particular demand for an absolute inner explanation lead to a particular form of mistaken reasoning that's called a morality? Um, so, I mean, I guess I should say, first of all, it's somewhat confusing and maybe also somewhat, somewhat of an interpretive problem to explain, but anyway, it's definitely somewhat confusing that, you know, there's these syllogisms here. And but like the the demand of reason is basically to be able to supply syllogisms to, to explain our judgments. In this case, categorical syllogisms. So, um, but there's also like remember the title of this section is the dialectical inferences of pure reason. So there's also like under that demand, you carry out a certain syllogism whose conclusion is something that goes beyond experience. So it's going in the other direction, but it's not really part of this series. Um, and yet, it does appear that the syllogisms in this case are categorical syllogisms. And um, Um, and perhaps that the syllogisms in the case of the antinomies are hypothetical syllogisms. So, where did I write down? There's an Example of a syllogism somewhere in the antinomies. I don't know if you can find it now. Okay, but I mean that's that's kind of like I said, that's kind of hard to explain. Again, it's like there's a systematic thing I, I don't understand going on here where the syllogism that we reach basically the, the dialectical inference of pure reason is the inference from the object of experience to this supersensible explanation. 
um, why is it that this inference is somehow like the syllogisms here that are causing us to make it? I'm not sure if I can explain that. Um, so, um, but beyond that, like, what is a plurality zone? And why is this part called a plurality zone? So, like, the way Kant defines a paralogism is um, um, just basically any formally invalid syllogism in general. So this is B399 on page 328 in the translation. A logical paralogism is a syllogism which is fallacious in form, be its content what it may. So, but it seems like he has a particular fallacy in mind, right? So like any syllogism, you know, like, so for example, if I were to say, This instead, this is a formally invalid syllogism, right? Like, um, like uh, all apes have hair, um, all humans have hair, therefore all humans are apes. Right? So, I mean, sometimes the conclusion might be true, but not because of the premise. Uh, but it's right. So, I mean, that's a type of formally invalid syllogism, but Kant seems to have a particular type of formally invalid syllogism in mind, which is what he calls the sophisma figure realis, the sophism of the figure of speech, or it's also sometimes called uh, the um, um uh quaternio terminorum the, the syllogism of like the fourness of the terms right and what what happens with this kind of syllogism is that you use this it looks like you have the same concept here as the middle term but in fact you use a word in two different senses in the two premises Right, so like if you were to say, you know, uh, 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 every bank is the side of a river. That's not really the right definition of bank in that sense. But never mind. Every bank is the side of a river. Um, you know, Wells Fargo is a bank, therefore Wells Fargo is the side of a river, right? So, like, that's, I mean, it, it, so it's a syllogism that looks formally correct, but only because of a equivocation in the middle term. Um, so, um, now, so you know, a logical paralogism is, you know, as Kant says about logical sophisms in general, a logical paralogism is like a trick. I mean, it's a mistake you could fall into if you're not thinking carefully, presumably not with bank, but with some other kinds of words that are more like, uh, um, like the famous thing about uh, the famous ancient Greek paradox about how uh, when you say ox cart, ox cart goes through your mouth, and therefore an ox cart can go through your mouth, <laughs> right? So, like, you may like it's easy to not that easy, but it's <laughs> that's still not a very good example. It's a better example, but I'm like trying to think of one where you could actually be fooled by it. I mean, you could actually be fooled into it yourself by not noticing. The shades and difference of the meaning of certain words. Um, 
or you know you could use it to trick someone else into into accepting your conclusion or into thinking you're you're a good arguer or something by like hoping they won't notice that you could use the the same word in two different senses. But like once that has been pointed out, the illusion goes away. But again, Kant is going to say that in the case of a transcendental um, illusion, so that is in the case of a transcendental, transcendental fallacious syllogism, a transcendental paralogism, there's something that these are not just two random words that happen to, like two random things that happen to have the same name. There's, it, it really is in a sense one concept here, but we use it in two different ways. And there's something that's like forcing us to use it in one way in the major and use it in the other way in the minor. And even once it's pointed out, the illusion doesn't completely disappear. Um, So in other words, the equivocation is not contained in a word that we have, you know, so like it would have, you know, like in a more precise language, we would have had two different words or something like that. The, 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 the equivocation is not found in the word. The equivocation is actually contained in the concept of the mediating term. So it's like, if you ask how that can be, well, I mean, the whole activity was about that. Right, the transcendental antiboly of the pure concept of reflection. So antiboly is just another word for sometimes it's used with a slightly different thing, but it's basically another word for equivocation. The concepts of reflection, like inherently, have two different meanings that were that so I mean. Is that the same as the equivocation we're talking about here, or is it a different one? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. He certainly doesn't say it's the same. And as I pointed out before, he seems to say that the illusion in the transcendent on Tivoli is not a natural illusion, right? That's only under the, the pressure of philosophy that Leibniz, you know, fell into this illusion, but it like it. It, like it wouldn't naturally trick people, whereas this is a natural illusion. So it's not the same illusion, but is it driven by the same antiboly? Well, anyway, that's all I can say about it, but I don't know. Um, okay, so I mean, that kind of explains what is going to be going on here. The thing is that if you look at the uh, um, um, the faulty co cosmological or the description of the faulty cosmological syllogisms in the antinomy. This was the place I found before, but this isn't the place that has an example. It's one place in the amphibole where there's an example. And I know I wrote it down in my notes, but now I can't find it in my notes here. <laughs> but um, this is on the bottom of. B527, top of B528, on page 444 in the translation. These considerations make it clear that the major premise of the cosmological inference takes the conditioned in the transcendental sense of a pure category, while the minor premise takes it in the empirical sense of a concept of the understanding applied to mere appearances. I mean, that does kind of sound like the same activity when you're talking about the antithesis. But anyway, the argument thus commits that dialectical fallacy, which is entitled Sophisma Figura Dictionis, right? So the, the, so the, the faulty, the dialectical inferences in the antinomy are also um, involve the same fallacy. So it doesn't really get us to the explanation of what's different about the faulty inferences in the paralogism that causes them to cause paralysis. I mean, I think like one thing may be that maybe like in all, like maybe every invalid syllogism is a paralogism. So all three parts about are, are about paralogisms, but then like the second part of the antinomy, it's not just that the paralogism, 
but there's two competing priorities and so lead us to uh, a contradiction. That's why it's called the infinity. And then I'm not sure what to say about the ideal. There's no examples of a syllogism given in the ideal. So you just have to kind of figure out what it would be. And it's not easy. Um, all right. Um, so that's all probably more time than I should have spent on things I don't understand very well. Um, um, I think I can understand better what, like, what mistake is being made in the play. So in the A edition, there are actually four paralogisms. That is, there's four um, invalid syllogisms going through the order of categories. Although, as Hot says, here we're going to go through the, we're not going through them in the usual order. When we start with substance. Then um, yeah, we start with substance, then quality. So we're actually going, starting with substance and going backwards through the table. Um, uh, so wait, that's probably awesome. Oh no, it's just visible in the Zoom. All right. So, um, so in the A edition, each one of these has its own paralysis. In the B edition, he only gives an example for the first one. So this example is on um, B 410 to 11, page 371 of the translation. Let's see what that is. Don't think I want to erase this and it's for me. Just write it here. So it's like that which cannot be thought otherwise than the subject. So I'm going to shorten this a little bit. Is a subject. That's the major premise. And then the minor premise is thinking being as such cannot be thought Otherwise, than as subject. And the conclusion is um, thinking being is a substance. Thinking being as such is a substance. See, the as such thing is important because um, we're going to conclude from this to the immateriality of the soul. That is, the thinking being simply as such, without considering any other attributes, is a substance. So that means, like, it can't be an extended substance. It's a thinking substance. Um, that's basically the train of thought that Descartes follows in meditation. All right. 
So anyway, so you can see here, like uh, by comparing it to this syllogism, where the equivocation must be. Right, this thing is the predicate of the conclusion, so it corresponds to B over there. Here it is, right? And this thing is the subject of the conclusion, so it corresponds to A over there. Oops. Oh, no, that's. I was So the middle term is this thing, C, that which cannot be thought otherwise than a subject. So somehow the equivocation, the transcendental ambivalence is between the use of this phrase cannot be thought otherwise than a subject in the major premise and the use of it in the minor premise. Now, I mean, based on the footnote here, this in Kemp Smith, this is note A on 371. Um, starts, thought is taken in the two premises in totally different senses. So it makes it seem that in particular, the uh, the equivocation is on the word thought. I'm actually not sure that's right. Um, in fact, I used to say, but I thought it was wrong. Now I just say I'm not sure it's right after thinking about it some more. I mean, it seems obvious in English, but in the original, it's like so. Um, So thought in that footnote is sustaining, right? It's like thought as a noun, thinking. Um, this is actually the infinitive and the like the two things. We don't say that in the pre, but you can but you can get something similar from the gerund thinking, right? So. Whereas thought here is the passive participle, the dot, right? Like, um, like think, <laughs> right? Like if, if think were a regular verb, then this would be think, <laughs> right? So, um, so when he says in the footnote that thinking is used in two different senses, He's not referring like, or he's not clearly referring to this word in particular. I mean, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Um, but in any case, it's 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 clear that whether it's a misword in particular or not, that this whole thing is where the equivocation is. You can see that just from the structure, right? So. Um, Okay, so what's the equivocation? Um, well, So let me start with something different, although I would be somehow related. Like, what's the actual content of the thought I exist? Now, I mean, um, the 
Um, starting on G418, Kant gives a different version of the paralogisms that starts with I exist. Um, Actually, it starts with I think, but I think understood to mean I exist thinking. Right? So, the, yeah, this starts on B418 on page 375 in the translation. And then there's a whole, uh, like, another way of going through the categories here, but this time to begin with modality. Begin with modality, the existence, one of the categories of modality. Right, possibility, existence, and necessity. And uh, without naming names, I think what he, what he suggests with this is Descartes' procedure. Descartes starts with I exist, and then the next step is as substance, and then the next step is as simple, and then the next step is as one. Um, whereas uh, this other argument he's talking about. And what I think he has in mind here is um, Christian Wolff's, the beginning of his, of Christian Wolff's German metaphysics. So Christian Wolff was a follower of Leibniz. And, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this before in this class or not, but Kant sometimes mentions him. He was a follower of Leibniz. He was unlike Leibniz. He was the author of huge systematic treatises with like theorems and uh, uh, proofs and whatever. Um, and, you know, um, as Kant puts it, the Leibnizio Wolfian philosophy was really the philosophy that was dominant in Germany when Kant was being educated. So, um, so, uh, so anyway, Christian Wolf, in his, he wrote some books in Latin and some in German. He wrote a Latin metaphysics and a German metaphysics. And the German metaphysics begins with a kind of version of the cognitive argument, but it's not personal. It's not like I exist and therefore blah, blah, blah. It's just like what is contained in the concept of a thinking being as such. That's what it starts with. So I think that's the argument that Kant is thinking about in the main section. The argument of like Wolfian rational psychology. So anyway, but um, um, it doesn't make that much difference because I think the error is going to be the same in search in both versions. So I'm going to start by asking, like, what's the actual content when I think I exist? So um, So what Kant says about this, this is B420, right? So it's when he's talking about that Cartesian line of thought um, on page 376 in the translation. Oh no, 377, here it is. I can start at the bottom of 376. How indeed should it be possible by means of the unity of consciousness, which we only know, know here translates canon. Okay, it's like related to this word of that we keep translating of knowledge. But uh, um, it means like to recognize something like that. Anyway, um, so, um, which we only know because we, so let me start again. How indeed should it be possible by means of the unity of consciousness, which we only know because we cannot but make use of it as indispensable for the possibility of experience to pass out beyond experience and even to extend our knowledge to the nature of all thinking beings in general through the empirical, but in respect of every sort of intuition, the quite indeterminate proposition, I think. So like what he's, I think what Kant is saying there 
I, mean, I think the key part is, let me read this part again. The unity of consciousness, which we only know because we cannot but make use of it as indispensable for the possibility of experience. So like what I'm really certain of when I say I exist is that I experience. That is that I think a manifold of sensible intuitions, or that is that I'm an actual discursive intellect. That's what I'm certain of. So the unity of apperception um, that it's through a single principle in me, which is um, the vehicle of the categories <laughs> to which the manifold conforms. Um, um, how do I know? How do I know that there's that single principle? And the answer, I think, so So this really means, according to Todd, this really means I experience. That's what I'm certain. And I tried to explain when I talked about the transcendental deduction of how I can be certain. So if that's what I'm certain, um, um, how do I know that there's a single Principle that's response that's like that the whole manifold of sense corresponds to. And the answer, I think, is I only know it by abstraction. That is, I ignore all the details of what it is I experience and just focus on the fact that I'm experienced. And all that's left then is the fact that there's some unifying principle. That's the transcendental unity of apperception. So, um, just to make like an equal sign here, and then. Well, maybe. Yeah, by abstraction, I reduce, I experience, and I experience is always like I experience this manifest, basically. By abstraction, I reduce it to just I think, right? That is by ignoring everything else the form of intuition, the actual sensation, the actual empirical concepts I'm deploying, everything like that. By ignoring or abstracting from everything else, all I'm left with is the fact that I think. Now that um, the fundamental mistake that's going to be re responsible for the equivocation here, for the fallacious inference, is to um, believe that because I can carry out this abstraction, um, there must be something that actually could exist separately that is, that's the I think. This is where Kant says this, this is B427. Um, on page 380 in the translation. Um, the dialectical illusion in rational psychology arises from the confusion of an idea of reason, the idea of a pure intelligence with the completely undetermined concept of a thinking being in general. I think myself on behalf of a possible experience, at the same time abstracting from all actual experience. 
And I conclude therefrom that I can become conscious of my existence even apart from experience and its empirical conditions. In so doing, I am confusing the possible abstraction from my empirically determined existence with the supposed consciousness of a possible separate existence of my thinking self. Right, so um, the idea of a pure intelligence is an idea of reason. It's an idea of I guess it's the first transcendental idea, right? So it's something super sensible that could never be given an experience. I confuse that with the completely undetermined concept of thinking being in general, right? That is by abstraction of all the details of what it actually means that I think or that I exist. But now you can see that it doesn't really matter where you start with. But by by extracting extracting from all the details of what it is I'm really sure about when I'm when I say I'm sure I exist, what I'm really sure about is about this experience. By extracting from all the details, sure enough, I'm left with a concept that contains nothing but just the fact that I'm thinking. But it's wrong to confuse that with a concept that would completely determine its object just by the fact that it's thinking. That would be the concept of pure intelligence. Did that make sense? The last thing I just said. Did that make sense? Earlier, you said like it's not separate, like not separate from experience. Right. It's not like. Um. What I actually recognize or know what I'm certain of is the actual experience I have. Um, like, I only know it's possible because it's actual. Um, so, uh, so, like, the I think by itself uh, is just like the empty form that something could be filled into to be an experience. Um, and, you know, like, so the fact that I know that I think is an abstraction from the more complete thing I know about myself, namely that I have this experience. Um, but there, um, um, but, but there's also, you can, that is reason leads us to believe that the concept thinking being it doesn't need any other details to be filled in in order to determine its object. Its object is just a thinking being and nothing else. That would be a pure intelligence. Okay. So, I mean, this is why I'm not sure the equivocation is really on thought. No, I guess the equivocation is on thought. That's why I keep going back to quickly. But so, so that like, um, what we say here, that which cannot be thought otherwise than as subject, is a substance. We mean like, um, if you've got the complete thought of a thing. And you find that um, um, given everything about it, it can't be thought otherwise than a subject, then it's a substance. But here, when we say a thinking being as such cannot be thought otherwise than a subject, a thinking being as such is this I think. 
It's a thinking being in abstraction of everything else about it. Not taking into account everything about it, but leaving everything out, right? And once you leave everything else, sure enough, there's no way to think of it as anything other than subject. I mean, you can't think of it as anything other than sub the subject because it has no content that could be predicated. You have abstracted from all the time. Um, but so like cannot be thought otherwise than like here means, you know, no matter how much you take into account about it, and the major premise means no matter how much you take into account about it, you can't think of it as other than substance. Here it means like um um as long as you only think about it just as what's the object of your concept. See, I mean, this is what's very confusing. Like, it almost seems like you could say the equivocation is here on a thinking being as such, but of course that doesn't fit the pattern at all. <laughs> but it's right, like, I guess you could say what would make this a valid syllogism and allow me to use this in the same sense in both premises would be if a thinking being as such meant this concept of thinking being a pure, a pure intelligence. A pure intelligence is something that has no other attributes but thinking. There isn't anything else to take into account about it. Somehow, just by specifying that it's thinking, you thought the whole object. Now, like, is that possible? Not for us, anyway, says Kant, right? Like, we can't think anything that way, actual objects using just a concept. That's, that's a noumena, right? So, like, um, so, uh, but, like, if that is what we were working with, if that's what we meant by thinking being as such, then you could use this in the same sense in both premises and the conclusion would follow. Um, but then, although it would be valid, we wouldn't have any knowledge of the minor premise. <laughs> right? Because the minor premise would, would mean a pure intelligence cannot be thought other than a subject. And a pure intelligence is not a possible object of our country. So we wouldn't know the minor premise. So even though the conclusion would follow, the syllogism wouldn't tell us anything, right? So to make the minor premise something we know, we have to take a thinking being as such to mean a thinking being an abstraction from everything else about it. And once you say that, you cannot be thought otherwise than as means something different than the major premise and the minor premise, and so the conclusion doesn't follow. Um, see that I'm out of time. Obviously, there's a lot more I can say about this to try and make it clear. Yeah. The only way to make that make sense is to have the thinking being that we can't. Uh, yes, but it's like I'm, I'm trying to, to put that together with not saying that the problem is that it's a fallacy of equivocation or sophisma figurae utilis. That it's so, I mean, he says both things, right? He says both, but the, the problem is that um, we're confusing abstraction or the possibility of abstraction for the idea of a separate pure intelligence that can be understood on its own. But he also says that this syllogism is bad because, because the middle term is taken in two different senses. So I'm trying to put those things together to say, like, if we could use the idea of reason here, then we could use this in the same sense in both premises. And so it would be a valid syllogism. But because we can't, because we're really putting here as an abstraction, 
therefore, it can't be the same thing, but it cannot be thought otherwise than in the two premises. So, I'm sorry, I guess, did, did that help? Did that answer your question or not? A little bit, yeah. It does, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That's all I have time for. Um, but uh, well, it looks like the people who are on Zoom already left. <laughs> But uh, hopefully some people will watch this on YouTube and um, and uh, thank you for coming. Um,